Last episode, we managed to make our oscillator somewhat independent of ambient temperature. Also, we tuned it properly, so that it now conforms to the volt per octave standard. The result is a perfectly usable sawtooth VCO. But since its feature set is rather sparse, I came up with a few ways to expand it. Before we get into that though, a user named Federico reminded me that our oscillator's temperature dependence and stability could be improved even more by including thermistors in the design. So let's talk about that first. When I claimed that the NPN and the PNP transistors react the same way to a given rise in ambient temperature, that was, as with most things I explain here, a broad generalization. Reality is, again, much more complex. If you really want to dive into it, check out the ebus mol equation. I put a link to it in the description. But since I'd like to keep it simple here, and frankly can't really wrap my head around that equation, let's do a really primitive experiment. Last time I first touched the PNP, then the NPN transistor. That was to demonstrate how one lowers, while the other raises the pitch when they are getting warmer. What I didn't do is touch both of them at the same time. In a perfect world, and with perfectly equally warm fingers, that wouldn't change the pitch at all. Let's see what happens in reality. As you can hear, the PNP wins. The pitch is going down before it's stabilizing. So we need to find a way to tame the PNP's response to temperature changes a bit. At least, that's what I've deducted. And this is where thermistors come into play. NTC thermistors, to be precise. These are basically resistors that react to temperature changes. And because they're NTC, which stands for negative temperature coefficient, their resistance value decreases if they get warmer. How's that useful? Well, we know that the PNP transistor is opening up too much for a given rise in temperature. And to counteract that, we would need to raise the voltage at its base. Because, remember, for the PNP transistor, an increase in pressure coming from here means that the seal is forced to close down, raising the pressure level up here. But how do we raise the voltage here along with a rise in temperature? It's actually quite simple. By adding thermistors in series with the 100k ohm resistors over here. To see how that works, let's isolate the offset path for a second. So we have a fixed voltage coming in from here. This is then scaled down by a voltage divider. Before, that voltage divider was set to an unchanging ratio, but by adding the thermistor after the 100k ohm resistor, that ratio now becomes variable. Because the resistance values of two resistors in series simply add up, we can view them like one single bigger resistor, whose value now depends on temperature. And that makes the whole voltage divider react to temperature changes. If it gets warmer, this resistor will weaken and let more current through, which in turn raises the divider's output voltage, which is exactly what we need to tame our PNP transistor. And yes, the whole concept also works for our multi-input voltage divider, as long as we add a thermistor for every input path. Okay, but which value should we pick for the thermistors? To be honest, I'm a bit out of my depth here, because my usual method of trial and error probably won't get us very far. So I'm going to rely on the work of smarter people than me. René Schmitz, who is running a great DIY synth page that you should definitely check out, designed a VCO that I'm drawing heavily from for this series. In that VCO's design, René used 10K thermistors, paired with the regular 100K ohm resistors. And because I trust that he knows what he's doing, I suggest we just do the same. Applying this is thankfully really simple. The thermistors go between the 100k resistors connecting offset and sequencer input and the PNP space. There's one catch to this though. 
we'll have to retune our oscillator because the ratio between the resistances here and the trimmer over there is definitely off now since the thermistors add at least a few k ohms to the mix. But let's not rush that. We can make our lives a little easier by implementing a quick and simple feature addition. Up until now we only had what you would call a coarse tuning potentiometer, where a small turn will result in a big change in bass frequency. Most VCOs offer an additional fine tuning pot though. And for good reason. It allows for a much more precise adjustment of the bass frequency. This not only helps with tuning the VCO, it also makes it much easier to slightly detune it against other VCOs. To understand how such a fine tuning pod works, let's first look at the coarse tuning pod we already have. All that we're doing there is pick a voltage between 0 and minus 12 volts, and then divide that voltage down by a factor of around 50. That factor is determined by the value of the resistances here and down here, resulting in an offset voltage ranging from 0 to approximately minus 240 millivolts. So a full turn of the pod's knob spends 240 millivolts, which, as we know, is a huge range frequency-wise. Our goal with the fine-tuning pod then is to cover a much smaller range, so that a slight turn of the knob results in only a very small change in bass frequency. To achieve this, we'll have to find a way to specifically divide an additional input voltage down by a much larger factor than 50. This sounds way more complicated than it actually is though. If we isolate this new input for now, we get a circuit that looks like this. The potentiometer setup is identical to the coarse tuning one, so we can produce any voltage between 0 and minus 12 volts here. Then this voltage is sent through our voltage divider. Now, if we want to change the divider's factor, we have two options, changing either of these two resistances. But since we need this one to stay right where it is to keep the volt per octave tracking for the sequencer input, the only option is changing this one up here. For the other inputs, we used 100k ohm resistors. So for the fine tuning pod, we could use a 1 mega ohm one, leaving us with a divide down factor of about 500. The resulting offset voltage added to the one coming from our coarse tuning pod and the sequencer voltage would then range from 0 to minus 24 millivolts, which should give us a decently sensitive fine tuning knob. Add in a 10k thermistor, like before, and we should be good. So I'll set up a second 100k ohm potentiometer next to our coarse tuning one. Next, let's connect it to the PNP space through a 1 mega ohm resistor and a 10k thermistor. And now we should be able to fine tune our VCO with this knob. Sounds good to me. Another feature that people requested in the comments is a second wave shape for our oscillator. Right now we are only putting out a sawtooth wave, but thankfully it's real easy to convert this into a variable pulse wave. And the kicker is, we won't even have to introduce any new components for that, because converting any kind of signal into pulses is actually the intended and primary usage for a Schmidt trigger inverter of which we conveniently have five more, sitting there unused in our 4106IC. So here's how this will work in theory. If we take our sawtooth wave and feed it into the Schmidt trigger inverter's input, that input will then be compared to these two thresholds. Whenever the voltage crosses the upper threshold on its way up, the inverter's output will flip off. And then once it passes the lower threshold on its way down, the output will turn on. So the resulting waveform, which I've overlaid as a dotted line here, will be rectangular, which is what we want, and out of phase with the original sawtooth wave, which sounds like something we don't want. But in reality, this doesn't matter much, because it won't affect the sound in any way. One thing you might notice right away is that the width of our output wave directly depends on the size of our input sawtooth. 
because the further up that saw wave's peak is, the later it will cross the lower threshold on its way down, causing the output to switch on later in the wave cycle. At the same time, we can see that our input needs to be at least this big for the whole thing to work at all. Because if we never cross the upper threshold, our output will just stay switched on permanently. Since that upper threshold sits relatively high at around 7 volts, we are unfortunately going to run into some trouble here. The sawtooth our oscillator is putting out is really rather quiet, swinging approximately between plus and minus 1.2 volts. So we will need to find a way to blow it up quite a bit. To do that, we can use one of the three remaining unused op amps in our TL074. Because these cannot only be used as buffers, but also, as their name implies, as amplifiers. To understand how that works, let's first take a closer look at our basic op amp buffer. When I first introduced this concept, I didn't really explain how and why it functions. I just claimed that this is the input and this is the output and left it at that. But this connection from here to here might have already struck you as odd. So let's clear that up by examining the op amp itself. As you already know, the terminal labeled plus is an input and the terminal on the other end is an output. But what about the one labeled minus? This might sound confusing at first, but it's also an input. We differentiate between the two by calling this one the inverting and that one the non-inverting input. At their core, they are both pressure sensors, much like the one in our Schmidt trigger inverters input. That means that they only sense voltage levels. No current is actually flowing in. The output, on the other hand, is essentially a water pump that's controlled by the two sensors. The idea here is this. Imagine we apply two different but steady voltages to the two inputs. The sensors will then measure those voltages and pass them as values into the op amp's core. Here, the voltage applied to the inverting terminal will be subtracted from the voltage applied to the non-inverting terminal. The resulting value is then multiplied by the op amp's gain, which is typically a very, very high number. And after that, the water pump is told to push the result of that multiplication out as a voltage. If that voltage exceeds the op amp supply voltage, the pump will just push out that supply voltage and call it a day, since it's not able to in or decrease it beyond that point. And because the op amp's gain is so huge, that will happen 99.9% .9 of the time. At least if we don't take measures to calm that gain down a fair bit. Which is exactly what we did when we built our buffers. We controlled the op amp with negative feedback. To pull that off, we simply connected the inverting input to the output terminal, while we applied our voltage to the non-inverting input. Now for the sake of analysis, let's imagine that input voltage to sit at a steady 5 volts. Before the op-amp starts to register what's happening at its inputs, the output will be switched off. This means that output and inverting input both sit at 0 volts at first. So, as a next step, the op amp will subtract 0 from 5 and multiply the result by a huge number. Finally, it will try to push its output voltage up to match the calculation's outcome. But as it's increasing that output voltage, the voltage at the inverting input will be raised accordingly. This means that the difference between the two inputs is shrinking down. At first, this doesn't matter much because the gain is so big. But as the voltage at the inverting input gets closer and closer to 5 volts, the difference will get so small that the gain suddenly isn't so huge anymore, relationally speaking. Then the whole system enters a state of balance. The output will stabilize at a voltage level that is a tiny fraction below 5 volts, so that the difference between the two inputs multiplied by the huge gain results, again, in exactly that voltage slightly below 5 volts. The whole thing is circular, a feedback loop. Now, if we were to in or decrease the voltage at the non-inverting input, that feedback loop would ensure that the output voltage is always following. So that's why this configuration works as a buffer. The output is simply mirroring the input. 
And because the relation between the two is one-to-one, -one, this is also widely referred to as a unity gain amplifier, which is a strange concept, an amplifier that doesn't amplify. So let's figure out how to build one that does amplify. Thankfully, getting there is really straightforward because what we're essentially trying to do is keep the negative feedback setup while at the same time making the output work harder to reach the state of balance. With our buffer, the output simply had to match the voltage applied to the non-inverting input. That's why there was no amplification. But what if pushing the voltage at the inverting input up required more force? To try this out, let's turn to our old pal, the voltage divider. Imagine we built a simple one with two 100k ohm resistors. Now any voltage that we send into here will be halved at this point. If we then connect our output here and that point to our inverting input, the output will have to push out 10 volts to match the voltage at the non-inverting input because the voltage divider will slash those 10 volts in half. That means that a setup like this will amplify a signal by a factor of two. If we then start messing with our voltage divider's ratio of resistance values, we can change that factor to any number we like, as long as that number is greater than one. That's because a voltage divider can only reduce, not increase a voltage. To test this, we can swap this resistor for a 100k ohm potentiometer. Then we'll connect our sawtooth to the non-inverting input and monitor the output with our oscilloscope. So I'm picking up our sawtooth from directly after the coupling capacitor and I'm routing it over to one of the remaining op-amps non-inverting inputs. Next, I'll add in the 100k resistor from output to inverting input. The potentiometer then needs to connect to that inverting input and to ground. Finally, I'll plug in my oscilloscope. Now, if I turn this knob, we should be able to change the volume of our sawtooth. And yeah, you can clearly see it grow and shrink in size. But something odd happens if I push it too far. The wave's peaks get cut off. This is because we are trying to exceed the op -amps limits, which are set by the supply voltage. So we know that this line up here is plus 12 volts, and this one down there is minus 12. If I push it even further, the wave gets cut off more and more, until it turns into a perfect 50% square wave. Now, if a fixed 50% square was all we wanted, we could just get rid of the voltage divider, scale the output down and call it a day. No need for a Schmidt trigger inverter. But since we want to be able to change the wave's width and we're already 90% of the way there, let's go the extra mile. You might be tempted to just grab the op amps output and send it into one of the remaining inverter's inputs. While the idea is not wrong, you'd probably fry the chip that way. That's because our sawtooth is swinging around the zero volts line. That means that its lower half is in the negatives, and our 4106 really doesn't like an input voltage above or below its supply rails. So everything we send in must stay neatly between zero and 12 volts. To guarantee that, we need to find a way to get rid of our wave's bottom half. Thankfully, doing that is real easy. Instead of connecting our op -amps output to the inverter's input with a piece of wire, we can use a diode, pointing towards the inverter. This creates a kind of one-way street, which only allows for positive voltages to pass through. With this, our 4106 is shielded from any negative voltages, and so we should be good, right? Nearly. There's one more issue. So whenever the voltage on this side is going to be negative, the diode will block. But when the diode is blocking, it's as if there's no connection. And that means that there will be no defined voltage at the inverter's input. As you may remember, these inputs really like to pick up static noise in that case. And that would really mess with our output waveform. To keep it nice and clean, we need to add a pull-down resistor. For that, we connect the inverter's input to ground through a 100k ohm resistor. 
This will ensure that whenever our diode is blocking, that input is pulled down to zero volts. And whenever a positive voltage is coming through, it won't be affected much because the resistor is so big. This allows our inverter to do its job properly. So let's see what kind of results we're getting with this. The setup is simple. First, a diode to connect the op amp's output to the inverter's input. Next, I'll add the pull-down resistor. And finally, I'll plug in my oscilloscope. So when our amplifier is fully cranked, the wave looks exactly like before, a 50% square wave. But as I turn it down, you can see how the wave's on phase gets wider and wider, until it completely takes over and our wave is no longer a wave. Unfortunately, this already happens after one third of our potentiometer's range, so the other two thirds are basically useless. Let's take a minute to fix this. As I've explained before, the inverter's always on state is triggered if our input sawtooth is too small. So we know that our amplifier needs a touch more power. To get there, we can simply increase the value of this resistor. That way, the voltage divider will force the op amp to work harder, making the output wave bigger on average. After some trial and error, I've settled on a 200k resistor here. So I'll swap out the 100k here for a 200k. And now we should be able to move evenly from 50 to 100% with one turn of the potentiometer. Seems to work nicely. So finally, let's figure out how we can listen to this. There's two problems with this wave, both of which we already know the solutions for. First, it's swinging with an offset voltage. So this lowest point down here is zero volts, which should be the center. And second, the volume is too high, since this highest point is at around 12 volts. To get rid of the offset voltage, we'll use AC coupling, just like we did in the first episode. The values can stay the same. One microfarad capacitor, 100k ohm resistor. So I'm taking the signal from our inverter's output and I'm routing it down here. Put in the cap and resistor and we should have a centered wave right here. Okay, but what about the volume? In the first episode, when we were trying to listen to our sawtooth wave, I just threw in a 50% voltage divider after this and called it a day. And while that did work, we should probably put a bit more thought into this. In the modular synth world, there's an internal volume standard that a lot of modules follow and expect, called 10 volts peak to peak. This might sound fancy, but all it means is that a waveform should be swinging between plus and minus 5 volts. Right now, our square is swinging between plus and minus 6 volts, so 12 volts peak to peak. That means that our voltage divider should reduce the signal by roughly 17%. To get there, we can use a combination of a 20k and a 100k resistor. If we put that after our coupling capacitor, the square wave should be ready to use. But what about the sawtooth? Like I said earlier, its volume is really rather low, from plus to minus 1.2 volts. So 2.4 volts peak to peak. To scale this up to 10 volts peak to peak, we'll have to build another amplifier using one of the remaining op amps. Since we need to increase the saw waves volume by a factor of a bit more than four, we can set our non-inverting amp up with a 100K and a 32K resistor. Then our 10 volt peak to peak sawtooth should be available here and good to go. Let's begin with our square wave. Here I only have to add the 20K, 100K voltage divider. Okay, so the square is done. For the sawtooth, I'll first take out our old voltage divider. Then I'll send the signal to this op amp's non-inverting input. Connect inverting input and output with a 100k resistor, add in a 32k from input to ground, and we're set. Now all that's left to do is check out how our square sounds.
So I'll attach an audio jack socket right here. Right now the pulse width is set to 50%, so the tone is very round and heavy. But as I turn the potentiometer, you can hear the sound get more and more nasal. Let's hear how it sounds playing a sequence. So there you have it. Added stability through thermistors, a fine tuning knob, a second variable pulse width output and modular conform volume levels. With this our VCO should be more than usable. There's only one thing left to deal with, getting it off the breadboard and into an actual module. So this is what we'll do in the next episode. I'll try to cover everything from making the panel and designing a stripboard layout to soldering it together and assembling everything into a finished product. In the meantime, you might be interested in checking out my Patreon. Along with scans of my sketches, I'm going to post complete schematics for all of the episodes on there. These should be helpful if you're trying to build along. Also, you'll have access to prototype ideas I'm currently working on. And if you're stuck on some circuit-related issue, I'm happy to help you out if you shoot me a message. So, anyways, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.